Hello! Today we're going to be meditating on Leviticus chapter 19, verses 11 to 18, uh, especially looking at loving our neighbor uh, as articulated there. So, let us begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, to introduce us to our meditation on the text of Leviticus, let us first go to Psalm 35, verses 19 to 28. Let not those gloat over me who are my enemies without cause. Let not those who hate me without reason maliciously wink the eye. They do not speak peaceably, but devise false accusations against those who live quietly in the land. They gape at me and say, Aha! Aha! With our own eyes we have seen it. O Lord, you have seen this. Be not silent. Do not be far from me, O Lord. Awake and rise to my defense. Contend for me, my God and Lord. Vindicate me in your righteousness, O Lord, my God. Do not let them gloat over me. Do not let them think, aha, just what we wanted, or say, we have swallowed him up. May all who gloat over my distress be put to shame and confusion. Put, may all who exalt themselves over me be clothed with shame and disgrace. May those who delight in my vindication shout for joy and gladness. May they always say, The Lord be exalted, who delights in the well-being of his servant. My tongue will speak of your righteousness and of your praises all day long. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. So, to introduce us to our specific text of meditation, Leviticus chapter 19, verses 11 to 18. Uh, where does this actually occur in the book? So this is coming in in the latter half of the book of Leviticus. So uh, the book of Leviticus is divided around chapters 16 and 17. Uh, 16 is the penultimate chapter of the book, the Day of Atonement, and it's looking into, well, basically how we are saved in the worship of our Lord. And, and Leviticus is all about the worship of our Lord and us being a holy community in worship. So uh, seeing that we are forgiven in Leviticus chapter 16, well, what are we forgiven from? And then we're going into various laws. Now, these aren't quite like uh, the few chapters building up to Leviticus chapter 16. Those are looking into um, uh, cleanliness, and we don't necessarily think of cleanliness as related to worship in a certain sense especially not in the Old Testament sense, which is looking into, well, are you properly acting uh, in the world or are you being associated with uh, death and disgrace and misappropriation in the world? And that's more what cleanliness is. It's not uh, strictly moral laws, but it does have an effect on, well, are you ready to, to worship God and be forgiven? So uh, we don't really have cleanliness as... A category within Christianity simply because we see in Jesus Christ all our uh, uncleanliness has been cleansed from us, that uh, Jesus Christ has perfectly cleansed us with a sacrifice upon the cross, and we are forgiven as God's people. And uh, we see this also within Leviticus 9, 16, the Day of Atonement, where God cleanses his people from sin. So now, as God's people, how should we live? And that's more or less where chapter 19 comes in. Chapter 19 is looking to uh, basically a mis miscellany of various commands that God has for his people, including one of the most famous commands that it gets quoted in the New Testament, and I'll get to that later on. Uh, with with uh, chapter 19, uh, we're really going the gamut with the Ten Commandments, um, each of the commands here can be tied back with one of the Ten Commandments, and one of the most important ones will actually be, uh, remember the Sabbath day by keeping holy, the third commandment, which is about proper worship. So a lot of these commands are about proper worship, but they also extend beyond proper worship to our neighbors, because if we're, if we're looking to proper worship of our Lord in his name, because the second commandment comes up a lot here, because uh, God reminds us repeatedly, I am the Lord your God, because... Um, if we're trying to act in holiness, we're trying to act in the holiness of God's name, because his name is placed upon us as his people. So how are you living in God's name? How are you properly orienting yourself to God, and how are you pro uh, preparing yourself for, for worship of the Lord? And it's not just 
worship in the sense of you're going to uh, the center of worship, which would be the tabernacle in the book of Leviticus, or, or you could even say in the temple as, as the nation of Israel gets settled in, in the promised land. So from Solomon onward, the temple. Um, for us today, we're actually oriented more towards the person of Jesus Christ because his flesh is is the clothing of our Lord in this world, like his flesh is the temple. So if we're looking to proper worship of God, we're gonna be looking primarily to Jesus Christ because we're worshiping through him uh, to, to laud and magnify the Lord our God in heaven, the, the, the heavenly father. So the entire Trinity is centered around Christological worship, uh, worship of Jesus Christ. Anyways, um, so we're looking to work properly worshiping uh, God, where he tells us to worship, but we also recognize that our entire lives is lived in in God's name, should be in due reverence to our Lord and centered on him. So, uh, in part, proper worship of God is properly living out the commandments he gave us, because if you're looking to, well, what did, what is worshiping God? Well, it's following his commands, and we can point specifically to the worship service, where God says, this is what you should be doing for me. Uh, but we can also point to, well, God also tells us to love our neighbors because we want to properly worship God in that, uh, following his command. So, uh, Leviticus chapter 19, uh, verse 11 begins after some of the commands specifically related into God himself. So, uh, verses 1 to 10 focus primarily on God himself. We'll see that... Um, what follows is going to, well, at least first, and what we're going to be looking at today, verses 11 to 18, we'll be looking towards our neighbors, but uh, following that, it kind of goes between uh, looking to God and the neighbors in the, in the latter half of the chapter. So uh, let's get into this, Leviticus chapter 19, verses 11 to 18. So, do not lie. Do not steal. Do not deceive one another. Do not swear falsely by my name, and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Do not defraud your neighbor or rob him. Do not hold back the wages of a hired man overnight. Do not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block in front of the blind, but fear your God. I am the Lord. Do not prefer justice. Do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great, but judge your neighbor fairly. Do not go about spreading slander among your people. Do not do anything that endangers your neighbor's life. I am the Lord. Do not hate your brother in your heart. Rebuke your neighbor frankly so you will not share in his guilt. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So, those are verses 11 to 18, Leviticus chapter 19. And you might notice how these tie specifically with a few commandments. So when we hear from the outset, uh, do not steal, that's the seventh commandment. So which is basically saying, uh, do not steal, <laughs> or you shall not steal, if, if you want to use the, that type of wording. It also says, do not lie. And what's the commandment about lying or bearing false witness? Well, that's the eighth commandment, which is you shall not bear false witness. Uh, but there's also... But besides these two commandments, another commandment that's underlying at least some of these, these specific commands in this section here in chapter 19 of Leviticus, which is the fifth commandment. So, uh, you shall not murder. And you kind of wonder, well, how does that really relate to any of this? And if you look to the commandment not to murder, well, it extends beyond just murder. Because if you're thinking about uh, uh, well, commandments, the, comm the Ten Commandments in general, well, if you um, if you skip out on a Sunday or something, it, well, that's relatively easy to do, and, and you might be tempted very much to do that. And many people have not gone to worship when and they should have gone to worship. So you can think about the third commandment, which is about worship, is relatively easy to break. But if you think of the fifth commandment, well, not murder. Well, that seems it's a little easier to keep because all I have to do is not go out and try to kill somebody. But uh, if you're looking, if you're looking at that commandment, it's more complicated than not murdering because 
it is looking to uh, the well-being of your neighbor. So Jesus actually expounds on this commandment in Matthew chapter 5, so in the New Testament. Uh, Jesus is saying that even if you um, look upon your neighbor in hatred, so if you, if you uh, are angry at your neighbor and if you you call him a horrible name, then that too is basically committing murder in your heart. So, you, so you're violating the fifth commandment by acting in anger against your neighbor. So the idea of, of the fifth commandment is not just about, well, refraining from murder. It's about trying to look after the well-being of your neighbor in their body. So in, the li in their life in this world, you are trying to um, uh, not harm them but and also trying to contribute to that because even withholding your help from your neighbor that would be well wrong and actually end up harming them anyways so uh, this would be the difference between a sin of commission where you're actively going out and doing something and a sin of omission where you're not doing something you should be doing and we see this with like all ten commandments of course but uh with, with the fifth commandment, you shall not murder, we see that withholding help is also contributing to our neighbor's harm as much as even going out and harming them. And, and this comes up uh, in this section and, as, as we go through it. So I'll be looking at uh, the fifth commandment, I'll be looking at the seventh, and I'm looking at the eighth. <clears throat> so, again, with uh, the commands, verse 11. Do not steal. This seems pretty self-evident, but uh, most people ha have trouble with this. Um, because if, if you're thinking to yourself, well, hey, I need such and such a thing. Hey, my, my friend over there has such and such a thing. Let me just grab it and, and use it for myself. Well, that's very easy to do. There, I don't know how many pens were taken away at the, at the Grocery store I used to work at because I used to be uh, up near the tills. I wasn't I wasn't a cashier, but I was up near the tills. And I don't know how many pens they went through a week because you you had to sign, um, in that day day and age anyways, you had to if you're using a credit card you had to sign your name on the receipt so that, uh, that you have some sort of proof that the signature on the back of the credit card was that person's. Uh, so um, signing this. That's signing. Oh yeah, so many pens were taken, and it it wasn't uh, intentional uh, quite a bit of the time because some people just pick up a pen and they not think about it and then just put it in their pocket or the purse or whatever, and they, they happen to walk out. Um, some people even came back and returned the pens because they just absentmindedly took them, and um, that's just just a very small example, but. There are some people who even feel entitled to their neighbor's objects, where they go, oh, well, my neighbor has something. Maybe it is a pen, maybe it's a crayon, I a pencil, who knows. But you go like, ah, I need this, I would like to have it, and then you just take it without permission. And maybe you put it back, of course. But um, that's still taking without permission, you're still reappropriating your neighbor's property. And even if we're going on a more grander scale, well, are you actually entitled to your neighbor's property here in this world? And we do have a lot of government programs that are trying to uh, help people who are uh, not as wealthy as the rest of us, uh, those who, who might not have um, uh, work or enough work in order to support themselves and their families. And this could be through no fault of their own. Not saying it is. Uh, could be, but who, who knows? It, every individual is different. So if somebody's not able to support themselves, um, some people feel entitled to what to, to the welfare programs, whereas these are welfare programs, these are not entitlements for each human being, and these are things that are basically acting as gifts for these people, and we even see an ill effect on some people when they're receiving these things because they're not actively working in order to receive uh, what they have, which is why a lot of social welfare, welfare programs are tied in with um, uh, actively searching for work or actually working a job. So they're meant to top up the income that you're receiving, they're not meant to replace it. As replacing that, you kind of remove all meaning from a person's work in general. 
But anyways, uh, some people feel entitled to, to take various things, whether this be those who uh, really need it, and that seems to be the more evident thing, where, yeah, somebody who's having a hard time making ends meet, they would be tempted to take these things and say, I need this, so I'm going to grab it. But then there's also other people who actually have enough to continue on in this life, and but they decide, I'm entitled to more, and they want more. So there are people who are trying to say that, uh, let's say, inter the internet or um, a smartphone is a, f a human right. We're obviously not... They're not. The internet and the phone, they're, they're certainly products that a lot of people are using, but that just because a lot of people are using them doesn't make them uh, uh, universal rights. And some people will, will steal these things out of a sense of um, entitlement, where, where they, don't, they don't necessarily need it, they, they don't necessarily, uh, they shouldn't necessarily have it, or have, but they try to take it by any means necessary. <coughs> Excuse me. And, and that's just some examples where you can look into this theft, where it's not just as cut as dry as um, somebody with a, with a domino mat, a toque, black toque and, and a black and white striped shirt just trying to steal bags with a dollar sign on them. Like it, it, it's not this obvious uh, a lot of the time. There are just people who are stealing these things and we just don't have the right to take them because there is a, such a thing as property in this world. And, and this is something that God himself recognizes. Everybody he is given things by God. And God allows us to possess these things for our blessing. And a lot of the time, we don't have everything being extremely equal in this world with regards to these blessings, whether by virtue of where you grew up or what, it, such as uh, country, neighborhood, it, uh, whatever. Uh, environmental factor is whether your area is subject to drought, subject to forest fire, subject to whatever. Um, there's environment there. There's government, there's so many other different factors with this. Uh, but uh, whatever, whatever God blesses you with in this lifetime, that is yours. And um, it is wrong to take things away from people. Now, of course, there's also the flip side to this, because if you're not stealing from people, so you're making sure that uh, you're not taking what, what your neighbors need, you should also be contributing to people who are actually in need. So on the flip side to the social welfare problem is like, well, there's going to be a lot of homeless people who need to eat, drink, and be clothed, as well as, as uh, have, have warmth and shelter. So what do we do with these people? Well, the obvious answer is, well, we should be taking care of them. And there's a question of how much we should be taking care of them and what we can actually provide, et cetera, et cetera. And those are good questions to ask, and they should be worked out pretty much on an individual basis. So, like, what can you provide? How can you help this specific person, et cetera, et cetera. And these are all good questions. But we shouldn't just say, well, I have a lot. This is sufficient for me. It's enough for me not to steal. I don't have to give it to anybody else. Well, that's just not... This is not good stewardship of the gifts that God has blessed you with. So, if you were properly living in the faith, then you'd be uh, uh, helping your neighbor out. So, so we have a lot in Do Not Steal. Well, that was a helicopter leaving the hospital. So, um, uh, dear Lord, good God Almighty, please help those who are being... Uh, Crafted in and out by the helicopters here, that you tend to their needs of, of body and also encourage them in spirit that they might find healing. Amen. Okay. So, next command here in verse 11 do not lie. So, I'll, I'll also pair this with the next, next command in verse 11. So, there's do not lie and there's also do not deceive one another. So, um, and actually, I'll pair this with the next one, too. So do not swear falsely by my name, and so profane the name of the Lord your God. I am the Lord. So when we're, when we're looking to the Eighth Commandment, you shall not bear false witness. What does this mean? Well, it's just more expansive than lying. So 
you're not just stopping lying, you're not just stopping deceiving one another, you're also thinking about your personal speech. And this would mean like you're not trying to deceive your neighbors by swearing falsely in my God's name. Now, of course, this is also a, a direct implication for the second commandment. The second commandment is do not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Or you could say uh, do not use the name of the Lord your God in vain. Uh, but you can misrepresent what you're trying to say by trying to invoke God himself. So with, with, uh, with bearing false witness, this is more in terms of a legal testimony. And in legal testimonies, you're not only bearing witness in front of human beings, but you're bearing witness as one who is in God's name. So you're, you're a Christian who is there, and if you're going to speak, you have to speak rightly. And if you do not speak rightly, then you're bringing in God, you're trying to drag God's name through the dirt by having him associate you with, uh, well, having you associate him there we go, with the sinner and sin itself. So if we're, if we're thinking about do, do not bear false witness, this has a whole bunch of different applications, which is do not lie. So do, you're not trying to deceive other people and there's a whole bunch of different reasons why people want to deceive one another. Either it's for uh, certain gains, prevention of punishment, uh, if you're trying to uh, smooth things out in a social manner, so you're not trying to bring up... Like, like the classic example would be with um, a wife asking her husband, do I look fat in this dress? And then the husband and just trying to quiet the little voice in his head which says, say, say the truth, and then um, says, no, of course you don't look at it. Now that's what we call white lies, but um, we go with white lies, and then we can also think about lar much larger lies, which are not just trying to smooth out certain things with socially, not just trying to look, or at least not intended for the well-being of the neighbor, but intended for your well-being. Um, and all of this is, is basically working against truth. So if you're thinking about, well, why is God forbidding us from lying? Well, he's actually wanting us to adhere to the truth at every single point in time. So we're not deceiving another person because we want to have the truth. We're not using God's name falsely because we want to live in accordance with the truth that he has wrought within this world. And we actually do see this in, well, the person of Jesus Christ, of course, but uh, just broadly God in terms of creation. Now, Jesus, in John chapter 1, it is called, well, the light, the word, and there's um, some wording in John chapter 1 which is also calling him, like, say, like the true light. So uh, he is the one who actually bears the truth. And how does he actually bear the truth? Well, he is the one who really establishes truth. So if he is the Logos, the Word, and he is speaking everything into existence, well, he's actually bringing truth into all things. So he is the Word that is truth itself. And if he's speaking things into being, well, he's establishing the truth of his own Word. So if he says, let there be light, that, or if he is the Word, let there be light, then there is light, because Jesus cannot speak falsely. He is speaking the truth. So if he's saying, there is light, then light will be. If he is saying uh, there is an expanse, then there will be an expanse between the waters above and the waters below. Um, if he, he says, uh, let us form man in our own image, then male and female, he created the, him in the image of God. So when, when Christ speaks, uh, the truth exists and this establishes reality. So when we're looking to... Um, uh, lies. Well, what are lies? Well, lies are going against the reality which God himself established. So we're going against what, uh, what God is using to operate within this world. And this is also why we can think of, well, swearing falsely in God's name, well, that's very much at issue, because if we're speaking any lie, we're going against, well, what he has established. Similar to um, any other Type of sin, because if we're violating the fifth commandment, thou shalt not murder with murder, then we're going against the life which God has called into being. So we're destroying that life. Um, if if we're going against one of the other, one of the other commandments, let's say, 
I do not commit adultery. Well, then we're desecrating the institution of marriage, which God has created for his, for his universe. And every single sin you can, you can really say the same is that it's going against what God has properly ordered and has decided for his creation. So lying is itself a rebellion against creation, the, the established facts of everything, not just, um, not just the inanimate objects, the, the things that God has called into existence, but also, also you, the people you interact with, and your inner thought world. So what, what thoughts are you actually having? Now, uh, with, with some of our interactions, we can, and, and this is differentiating between cultures, um, certain things we say could be in line with cultural expectations, but not but not necessarily telling the whole truth, but still be well accepted as uh, truth for that culture. Because if somebody asks you, hey, how are you doing? And you say, fine, uh, the usual expected answer is fine. Now, there could be certain things that are nagging at you, and fine might not be the whole truth, but if you say fine for the expediency of the conversation, um, you could, you might not actually be telling a lie in the sense that overall you feel that you actually are doing fine. But uh, we also have to make sure that we are not ourselves self-deceived by saying, well, I'm going to profess a different reality than the one that I experienced inside and, and then just kind of trick yourself into something that, that really isn't the case. And uh, this is, Actually, no, I won't go into that whole debate, but um, th this does get into a bit of an issue uh, within contemporary culture because some people are actually saying, well, my inner thought world isn't corresponding with the outer reality, specifically the reality of my own body. Uh, but this doesn't necessarily mean that um, your, your thoughts are, are themselves correct because if we're, we're looking more towards, well, what's coming into conflict. And if, if your words are not corresponding with your, your thought world, well, then there's a disconnect between what you're saying and what you're thinking, which would mean it's a lie. But if, you're, uh, if your thought world is saying something different and you even affirm that with your mouth, so you're truly expressing what's, what's in your head, but it doesn't correspond with the physical reality, well, then that's still in the category of falsehood because it's not speaking the whole truth about everything. So, um, for people who are, who are living a different life in their, their heads than what the outer reality is speaking to, well, this is a significant issue and bears a lot for the conversation. But I digress. So, uh, that's the verses 11 and 12. We're getting into the uh, seventh commandment, do not steal, and the eighth commandment, do not bear false witness. So, verse 13 uh, has a couple commands in there. The first one is do not defraud your neighbor or rob him. So this is this is kind of blending the two together now. And when we look into the small catechism, uh, Luther's small catechism, he actually does uh, look at these things himself because if if you are stealing something, you could be doing that very much out in the open, but there's also the possibility that uh, you're concealing your efforts, which a lot of these try to do to avoid getting in trouble. But uh, these things also bring dishonesty into it. So you're lying in order to obtain your neighbor's goods or whatever it happens to be. So it is kind of a blending of the two. Good. So, uh, in the Luther Small Catechism for the Seventh Commandment, it says, You shall not steal. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not take our neighbor's money or possessions. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of the obvious um, meaning of, of the statement. But Luther adds, Or get them in any dishonest way. So, if you're misrepresenting the situation, uh, this, is, this is also harmful. In Luther's Large Catechism, he gives an example of... Um, uh, kind of a, a, a cobbler, so somebody who makes shoes. And if you try to get things in a dishonest way there, you could actually go, well, I know it costs $10 to make a shoe. Or 
uh, let's say uh, $20 to make a pair of shoes there. You don't really buy just one shoe. So $20, pair of shoes. And, but you don't want to pay that much, so you then dishonestly say, well, I only have like $16, so I'll pay you $16 for these shoes. And if that uh, shoemaker is desperate for money, maybe they will make that deal, but uh, you're kind of forcing them into a situation where you're misrepresenting the, the actual cost of, the, of, of those shoes. So, so your neighbor is at, still working, of course, still getting money in, but that money is not going to cover any of their expenses because if they're losing um, uh, 20% of the money that they put into whatever they make, then they're eventually going to go bankrupt and can't help them. So uh, Luther cautions us in, in, in the explanation to, in the small catechism. So, uh, but help them to improve and protect his possessions and income. So Luther is trying to caution us to uh, help our neighbor. So this is kind of the flip side of the command. So not only are we uh, possibly guilty of doing a sin of uh, commission, where we're actually doing something against our neighbors, but we can be uh, committing a sin of omission, where we could be helping our neighbors in, in terms of worldly good, but we're not. But uh, yeah, you do find with, with some of the commands, uh, commandments, there there is some overlap. So you could be deceiving somebody um, in order to do something else. Um, so you could deceive somebody in order to murder them. You could deceive somebody in order to commit adultery, etc., etc., etc. And that would all be blending the eighth commandment: do not bear false witness into these things. So, um, yeah, do not defraud your neighbor or rob him. Uh, the next, next, for, next command in verse 13 is, do not hold back the wages of a hired man overnight. Okay, so this requires at least a little bit of explanation in terms of the Israelite culture at this time. So this is basically a day labor. And it's, it's really, really common at this period in time. It's very much common throughout the history of the world. But um, before you get into the whole, I'll pay you at the end of the week or end of two weeks, end of the month, so you have a check that is guaranteed to you after a certain period of time, uh, usually the way that you would actually get a steady income is if you just get paid at the end of the day. So you go to work uh, at some point in the day, you work a certain amount of time, and then your employer will go, okay, well, we made a deal at the beginning. Uh, I would pay you so much for so many hours. Here you go. Uh, we actually do see Jesus bring this up in a parable um, where Jesus has the parable of the workers in the field and um, a man goes out and he, he says that he's going to pay somebody a, a uh, denarius for, for working the whole day and people go, yeah, I'll work, I'll work a whole day for a denarius so that they go out, they work for that coin. Uh, denarius is actually about the wage for, for a whole day. Um, but there's not enough workers, so, so the master goes out again, uh, let's say around noon, picks up more guys, brings them over, promises to pay them in denarius. Uh, still not enough people, goes out in the afternoon, brings more people back, and uh, still, still some work left even at near the end of the day. So with one hour to go, he goes out, grabs some more people, brings them back, promises them in denarius. So at the end of the day, uh, the master is paying out all the money, he gives to the people who work one hour a denarius, and the people who work the entire day are going like, oh, ooh, we're going to get uh, a lot of, if uh, if we worked like eight hours and that guy only worked one, well, we're going to get eight of the eight denarii. Um, but with the workers who got there in mid-afternoon, also get a denarius. And then after them, the guys who got there around noon, also denarius. And then the guys in, who got there first thing in the morning, and they're expecting still more money they get they, and they get paid a denarius they go like why on earth are you giving us this amount we should be getting more because as we worked the entire day whereas these people didn't and jesus is telling the parable of course he's he's kind of in the position of the master uh he's saying to us well didn't i didn't i establish the wages at the beginning of the time that you worked so why are you complaining when I gave you exactly what I promised? 
So don't pay attention to what other people are getting, pay attention to what you're getting because this is exactly what I promised you to do. So we see an example of uh, this being uh, uh, kind of a negotiable wage as well as uh, kind of um, expected wages coming forth. But uh, you, you get paid at the end of the day. <clears throat> Anywho. So one of the one of the horrible things you can actually do is withhold wages. So if you if you say, well, I'll pay you in the morning. Well, you could be trying to do that in order to get that person to come back in the morning. And they go like, hey, well, why since you're here anyways, why don't you uh, work this day for me as well? So you're trying to secure these things, and no doubt people have tried various tactics like this or, or far worse tactics like this in order to make people work for them over over time. But um, what this is saying is, yeah, you don't withhold the wages from somebody. You don't establish a contract with somebody and then go back on that contract. So this is, again, kind of a blending of the Seventh and the Eighth Commandment, where it's, you're, not, you're actually withholding what is due, so you're stealing from them, be it, be it just in terms of time. So even if you pay the full amount at a later period in time, you are not doing so at, a, at the correct time of day so you are stealing from them so you're so this the amount that you were to pay them is rightfully belonging to them but you're withholding it for yourself so it's it's similar to when you grab your neighbor's pencil or pen and go like oh hey thanks for giving this to me when they did not give it to you and then you use it and go like there you go and then you give it back while well, you're taking it from them for a specific period of time without their permission so this is this is not good. Um, with with the eighth commandment, this is also um, dishonestly going back on a deal. So where, whereas it's more or less established that you would be paying somebody at the end of the day, end of the workday, uh, you are you are not truthful in this, and you are actually lying to that person. You're dishonest in your conduct. So uh, we also find that people who are employers who are dishonest in, in their employment tactics. Well, fewer people will work for them, fewer people will want to work for them, and people will not stay at those businesses as long. So we just see that, like across the board, um, trust and truth is what we look for when we're, when we're trying to live in this world as well as procure possessions, because we want to have all the blessings that God so richly bestows on us. Um, and, and we want our work to have meaning. Anyways, um, verse 14. So do not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block in front of the blind, but fear your God, I am the Lord. So apart from this just being a couple of mean things to do, so um, um, basically speaking to people who cannot hear you uh, and, and cursing them out uh, when they can't hear you, so, you, so you're sure that you can, uh, can get away with this. You'd also be... Um, uh, trip and blind people and they wouldn't necessarily be able to point out that it was you uh, so you would be able to get away with this. So uh, just beyond the wicked nature of harming people who are disabled, which is fairly abhorrent in our culture even today, and uh, I think people are even uh, more outraged at uh, at uh, what the, the fairness of, in treatment of disabled individuals today. I think I think we're a little bit more sensitive to this issue now. Um, some people possibly even oversensitive um, to to the issue where they say they say, well if so if you don't do such and such for this group of people then you're evil. I digress. I digress. I'm sorry. Anyways but um, there is some sensitivity to this even today. So we should definitely make accommodations for those who, who uh, are not as uh, abled as the rest of us. So if somebody is blind, well, you want to make sure that they're able to get around. And uh, it, maybe, maybe this individual is able to get around quite well as somebody who's blind, but so, so but uh, uh, so you don't necessarily, you're not necessarily committing a sin of omission if you're not at helping them, but you can still definitely commit a sin of commission where you actually go out and harm them, so don't do that. Um, but in general, this, is, this goes beyond, beyond just uh, 
don't hurt disabled people, but it's don't do things when you know that they're wrong, even though you can get away with it. So even though you know you won't be punished, this is still evil. And I've been in so many different situations where people are going like, yeah, if you don't get caught, that, and it's all good. It's, it's, it's not illegal if you don't get caught. It's not wrong if you don't get caught, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And people use this excuse to um, do simple things like um, go onto pro property to, to uh, use different um, um, possessions of their neighbors. Or they, or they might even uh, apply this to things beyond stealing, and they may say, "Well, yeah, if I if I cheat on my wife, as long as I don't get caught, it's not wrong. It gives makes me happy, makes my mistress happy, and if I'm happy, then I make my wife happy, and I give her a lot of gifts out of guilt, anyways. So, yeah. anyways, but essentially." No matter what you're doing, if, if, it's, if it's wrong, it's still wrong. So you can't just say, well, I get to do whatever I want just because I'm not going to get punished. This is just an evil mentality and it's a self-justification for your own wickedness. So you're, you should not be doing this. And we're all tempted to do this. Um, even in secular philosophy, Plato had the idea of the Ring of Gyges. This comes up in one of the dialogues uh, of Plato, where he where he says that uh, if, if someone had the Ring of Gyges, which makes you invisible, so maybe maybe you think of the One Ring in Lord of the Rings where Frodo puts it on and then he's invisible. Um, uh, somebody with that ring on would be, uh, is not morally culpable for a lot of their actions because people can't catch them. Therefore, a corrupt individual will go out and do all sorts of mischief. Um, H.G. Wells revitalized that specific idea in his story, The Invisible Man, where the invisible man turns himself completely invisible and then he's like, I get to rule the country now because I can and harm a whole bunch of people and they can't catch me. And yeah, people just have this mentality where if I can get away with it, therefore it's good. So that's just the evil lurking within your heart, just trying to take away other people's possessions, try to deceive them, try to abuse them, to harm them. It is still wrong, even if you don't get caught. Um, this is why the idea of hell is actually so comforting in certain respects. Uh, definitely not for anybody who's going there. It's not comforting, but that's more or less the point, is there are people in this world who will not be subject to punishment for the evil that they do. And it is absolutely terrifying to think that they get to do whatever horrible, disgusting, perverted thing that they have done to this world and they get away with it. It's terrifying. Um, one, of the, one of the examples that I, that's, that I go to all the time is the example of Pol Pot. Pol Pot was the dictator of Cambodia. He was largely responsible for the Cambodian genocide uh, in the in the 1970s. Killed a quarter of the country's population, just millions of people, uh, brutally, brutally, and even also slowly, depending on which deaths that they died, they died. Whether it was um, having their heads bashed against trees, or because uh, they weren't work because Pol Pot deemed that they weren't worth the cost of a bullet, or um, uh, whether, whether he just allowed people to starve to death. Um, about a quarter of the population of the country died, millions upon millions, um, even, after, even after the genocide. He still remained in power in the government for years, years and years. And over time, he realized that um, he was losing ground in, in the government, so, so he went uh, kind of almost in hiding a little bit, uh, but he still could, he was still technically in charge of a lot of things, so even at a distance he had control in the government and then he died naturally in the 90s, like almost, practically 20 years after he committed vast atrocities, never punished, nothing.
And if that person can get away with a massive genocide and absolute cruelty, and there is no justice for him or the people that he harmed, then God does not exist and there is no hell. But if God does exist and justice in him exists, then there will be a hell for the evil that is wrought in this universe. Whew. Sorry. Anyways, I kind of getting off on a kind of getting off on that tension. Got a little bit emotional there. Anyways, uh, verse fifteen. Uh, so do not pervert justice. Do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great, but judge your neighbor fairly. So kind of in the same continuation of doing justice fairly. Um, this is also more or less in the Eighth Commandment, which is do not uh, bear false witness. Uh, an extension of this would also be to prefer justice in the sense that, because uh, the witnessing is kind of in terms of legal testimony, so if you're not allowing proper legal testimony to uh, convict people or free them, then you're also bearing false witness in the judgments that you make as, as you enact, um, um, well, yeah, enact judgment in certain matters. So for us as Christians, a lot of time people will say, well, you're not allowed to judge because it says do not judge and we go like, well, actually, if you read the entire statement in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, it says, do not judge lest you be judged by the same measure. Because <laughs> um, the idea that Jesus is trying to bring out there is, yeah, you're supposed to be judging, but you're supposed to be judging fairly. How you judge fairly? Well, you judge according to the law of God, and you do not show partiality. God himself is proclaiming all over the place that he is uh, impartial, that he does not show partiality to anybody he judges people fairly. So if you go, oh, well, this person committed murder, yes, but it's okay because they're poor, that's not good. That person violated the fifth commandment, they need to go to jail. Um, if for no other reason, then they need to be rehabilitated because they need to be punished for their sin. Yes, they also need to need to. Uh, be made aware of their sins so that they can repent and and uh, and find forgiveness in Jesus Christ and also hopefully be productive members of society again. So uh, it's not as though that we uh, don't want to give sympathy where sympathy is due, but we shouldn't allow certain circumstances to sway us so much that we refuse to give proper punishment or proper reward where those things are due. So, um, so the example usually is, well, you show partiality to the poor, so you would give the poor people who are, are in dire straits uh, a break for, for whatever they've done. And then the other example would be with the rich. Well, they're rich, they can help you out financially or otherwise. So you show favoritism to them, well, no. Neither of those are good options because you're not dealing with them as human beings. You're just dealing with them as, well, basically bank accounts. Yeah, you're reducing them to their monetary value. So, so instead of seeing them as individuals who are in need of correction, you're seeing them as uh, dollar signs or cent signs, depending if you're rich or you're poor, uh, in cartoon fashion. And we see a lot of this uh, today where people are going, well, certain groups of individuals are or impacted socioeconomically, so they don't have as much. So, oh, the, so certain communities are more inclined towards stealing, so we should give them a break. Um, no, what we should be doing is we should be trying to fix the socioeconomic inequalities there so that we don't produce more of these people, but these people we still need to deal with because as they've been brought into, uh, uh, brought into guilt through their own actions, and that guilt must be atoned for. So, uh, if, we're, if we're thinking about our own sense of, of impropriety, us as sinners, well, what about our situation? We are brought forth in this world as sinners, so as soon as we were conceived, we were sinners. Um, and when we exit the womb, we have no food, clothing, and drink anything, because we're just babies. Um, and we need to receive all these things from our parents. But, that, but even though we're hungry and naked when we're born, it doesn't mean that um, uh, God should let us off the hook for, for being sinful. And this is usually the argument that I hear against, 
um, uh, original sin, the doctrine of original sin, that, that we are born into sin, that we are from, from conception broken in our relationship with God and that needs to be mended. Um, the number one argument that I he hear is that, yeah, well, babies, they can't do anything. They haven't had the opportunity to commit acts of sin. Therefore, uh, they they should not be considered guilty or punished and blah, 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 blah. However, we still see punishment being given to them in death. So babies have died. Pe babies have died even within the womb. So this is an effect of the curse of sin within this world. So the curse of sin that we're all living in, the original sin that we have. And uh, if, if we're dying as those who have who are sinful now you might be forgiven jesus christ our lord and still die that's the case of pretty much every single christian who has ever lived uh this does not mean that babies are exempt but that they actually are subject to uh the, the evils of sin in this world so uh, god does not show partiality with, even in terms of age or or gender or nationality there is no partiality god judges all the same as human beings so if you have sinned god will judge you according to that sin if you've done good god will judge you according to that good if you are saved in jesus christ your lord the debt of your sin has been wiped away in him your guilt has atoned for in jesus christ at the cross you need not be judged according to that because it is completely wiped away from our accounts on in christ therefore whatever good you have is it's judged in the lord's sight so um it's not as though uh guilt is removed or partiality is shown in the and as if that god is just ignoring this but everything is properly atoned for in jesus christ so the guilt is is real god is not not ignoring it but it is properly dealt with in god's sense of justice okay uh let's continue on verse 16. So do not go about spreading slander among your people. Now, the straightforward application of the Eighth Commandment. So Eighth Commandment, do not give false testimony. Now, this is also in, in terms of slander, gospeling. So uh, if, if, if we're thinking of sin of commission, you might be actively lying or you might be withholding the truth if it's a sin of omission. But also you could be committing a sin of omission if you're not speaking about somebody in the best way. So you have the means to defend a person's reputation, but you don't. Um, one of the ways that you might actually even hurt somebody's reputation is going about slandering, gossiping. Even if something is true, you don't necessarily want to harm that person's reputation, their place in society by continuing this on. So if we're thinking about uh, people's well-being, yeah, you want to speak true, truly of them, at all times, but you also don't necessarily want to uh, harm their reputation because harming somebody's reputation will actually harm their place in society overall. Because uh, I've already made the point that uh, with do not hold back the wages of a hired man overnight, well, you, this is based on trust and truth. So if you're, if you're introducing gossiping and slander into the mix, well, now you're trying to see, make that person seem less trustworthy, less truthful, um, and you're creating a negative image so that that person is now no longer looked upon well within society and they're going to find it harder to get the jobs, to have friends, to do whatever. And uh, if you think back to high school where gossip is uh, kind of the tool of high school cliques, well, you really destroy somebody if you spread enough rumors about them, if you gossip enough. Um, that's kind of one of the more drastic examples, but you can still do that within society, larger societies, because even in small towns, if somebody has a word spoken against them and that it's just attached to their character forever, well, it's hard for them to do anything. In fact, this was the issue with um, the cultural phenomenon known as cancellation that we've seen within the past decade or so, uh, cancel culture and all that where the idea was, well, let's just say enough bad things about this person that to absolutely destroy their reputation so that they can no longer live in society. So they can't really go outside, they can no longer interact with people, they can't, and uh, even, even businesses might not want to really do any business with that person, so they can't get a job in order to get money to buy things, and even if they did have money to buy things that 
and certain stores would not let them inside. Like this is this is an absolutely terrible thing. So uh, even if you think that your your gossiping is not uh, that impactful, don't do it. <laughs> so again, speak about people in truth. Uh, you can you can do that to certain degrees where it's it's not slander, not gossiping. Um, but you do have to be careful not to do this. And it's a very easy thing to, to slip into. So, uh, do not do anything that endangers your neighbor's life. I am the Lord. So this, again, uh, the, the statement there, I am the Lord. So this is kind of the refrain that's being attached to certain things, but also kind of in different sections. So you can even think of do not perverting, uh, or sorry, um, yeah, perverting justice, spreading slander, and uh, doing anything to, to endanger your neighbor's life as part of a little block there. So, um, God himself is, seem, is seemingly implying that if you are uh, spreading gossip and slander, then this is, is actually endangering a person's life. Now, of course, more broadly, this is the fifth commandment. Do not murder, or if you, if you will, do not do anything to harm your neighbor in the body. So, uh, Luther's explanation to this fifth commandment is, we should fear and love God so that we do not hurt or harm our neighbor in his body, but help and support him in every physical need. So, this is getting to the sense of commission, sense of omission. So, do not commission is do not go actively out and hurt that person. Omission is do not withhold anything that person needs to actually live well. So, yeah, do not do anything that endangers your neighbor's life. I've been talking about this at length throughout, but uh, yeah, it's very obvious. Do not harm your neighbor. Uh, verse 17, do not hate your neighbor in your heart, rebuke your neighbor, frankly, so you will not share in his guilt. So this is um, what I was tying into with, with what Jesus was saying in Matthew chapter 5, where, where he was tying not just, um, not just murder with the fifth commandment, but he's saying that if you speak in anger against somebody, if you're, if you're trying to seek their harm, even in reputation, or, or just try to emotionally harm somebody, that is still under the fifth commandment, because you're trying to induce harm, and you're even trying to think about them in harm. So um, uh, you, your hate of your neighbor in your own heart, although not necessarily physically hurting your neighbor, or your, your neighbor might not even know about it, that is still something that is sinful against your neighbor because you're basically killing them in your own heart. So um, this, is, this is why Jesus is saying don't do that because it is actually an application of the fifth commandment. So do not hate your brother in your, your own heart uh, because this is harming them with you. And even if you're not harming them directly, it is harming your relationship with them. And since, again, relationships about trust, truth, uh, the establishment of the order of creation that Christ has brought about, we don't want this to, to happen. We actually want all people to live as God's people, to be in unison in the Lord, in his name. So don't hate your neighbor. Uh, and attached to this is kind of, instead of a prohibitive command, so there's all, a whole bunch of do nots, and we've thus far in these verses always seen do nots. Um, Oh, well, with the exception of uh, judge your neighbor fairly, verse 15, of course. Uh, there's, there's this other command, rebuke your neighbor, frankly, so you will not share in his guilt. So similar to what I was saying with um, people, people who might bring up, oh, you're Christian, do, don't judge. Well, in the broader speech that Jesus is actually saying, where he's saying don't judge, he's saying don't judge in order to, um, uh, yeah, well, basically don't judge hypocritically. So don't, don't say somebody is guilty of such and such without first recognizing that you yourself are a sinner in need of forgiveness. And then once forgiven, then you can rebuke your neighbor. You can and go, well, this is something you've done wrong. And as a forgiven Christian, now you're more able to try to point them to forgiveness in Christ. So you're not trying to do it for their harm. You're trying to do it for their good. And that really is what judgment in Christianity is all about. It's Yes, you are actually accusing people according to God's words, so you can look at all the laws that God has provided for you in his words in, in, in Scripture. You can apply these correctly, but these are for rebuke and correction so that you may actually find salvation in Jesus Christ. So, um, 
yes, rebuke your neighbor frankly so you will not share in his guilt. So uh, do not be part and parcel to your neighbor's sin. Do not associate yourself with this sin. Uh, do not be yourself guilty of this sin. Look, look at yourself. Are you guilty of this sin? If so, then stop doing it. Um, and try to try to seek help for not doing it. Uh, you can even uh, go to your neighbor and go like, yes, I'm also guilty of the sin that you're doing. Let us help each other so we don't continue doing it. That's also an option. That's what a lot of people are doing. Um, um, say, for example, with the Sixth Commandment, uh, don't commit adultery. Uh, some people are uh, addicted to pornography, so they have a buddy system. So you make yourself accountable to somebody else so that you don't do this horrible thing. You, like there's even uh, computer programs where if you go to certain websites, you'll send an email out to so-and-so going like, I have done this horrible, wicked thing. And you're like, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to let this person know that I've done something evil, so I'm going to refrain from doing that. And um, that's, that's uh, trying to seek help through uh, possible punishment, of course. Uh, correct, like correction through possible punishment which isn't necessarily what we hope to see in Christianity, but sometimes you have to use all the tools of the trade in order to try and per, uh, avoid sin. And there's also um, um, agreement, say like with um, Alcoholics Anonymous, this is also something that they do. So they know that, uh, well, drunkenness is, is itself a sin. You don't, you don't want to get drunk. So people in Alcoholics Anonymous, they realize this particular temptation they, they make themselves accountable to somebody else, and when they're having uh, certain certain thoughts to start drinking again, um, they, they contact somebody who's already been through the whole thing, and then that person can give them um, a, a much more informed perspective than somebody who's on the outside, who's, who's never experienced it. Anyways, um, verse 18, the last verse we have for today. So do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So, yes, uh, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against any one of your people. And uh, uh, the your people bit is looking at the fact that this is referring specifically to God's people, all those who are uh, declared to be of God, all those in the nation of Israel, so all believers, this is applying to you, is basically the idea here. So, don't seek revenge, bear a grudge. And this is still an application of Fifth Amendment, I shall not murder. So if you are seeking revenge, seeking, seeking uh, um, a working out of a grudge, well, this is you not forgiving them. This is you still acting in sin against somebody. You are not trying to work for their betterment, but you're trying to make yourself feel better. So it's not for your neighbor's good, it's for your own personal good, but as pretty much everybody who's who's gone into the revenge game can tell you, like it won't actually satisfy you. Like it it, it will give you a momentary a high of like, ah, I did this against my enemy. But ultimately it's rather fleeting because the, the thing that you're trying to um, seek revenge for, well, the effects of that are still there. So rather than forgiving your neighbor, moving on and, and accepting the loss that you've experienced, like the harm done to you that you're trying to seek revenge for, um, rather than forgive by bearing that pain and working through it, and, working through it and accepting it, you're just trying to solve this pain by harming another person. So it's not good for for you, not good for the other person. Um, yeah, it's it's just. A lack of forgiveness, a lack of godliness, if we're, if we're going out for the specific purpose of revenge or grudge. Now we, of course, we do want to seek um, proper restitution for, for evils. So we don't want, um, so it's not like if somebody goes out and murders another person, you go like, oh, well, he murdered my cousin. I just forgive him and I let him run around free. No, no, uh, that person is a dangerous individual. He killed somebody. Uh, you want to to bring them to the proper authorities so that uh, they are not within the general body of the population so that they might do this again. Uh, you also don't want them to, um, uh, to, to just not get away without punishment because we want punishment. We also don't want them to get away without being confronted with their sin so that they might actually be saved. Um, if, if you've ever read uh, Crime and Punishment, the novel, but 
Fyodor Dostoevsky. Uh, that's a lot of what it's about. Uh, the main character, he, he murders an individual and he's like, ah, I can get away with this. But throughout the entirety of the novel, he is experiencing terrible self-torment because he is confronted with his sin. And it's not until he's actually convicted of this sin and is paying the punishment for it that he actually feels some sort of growth afterwards, some sort of sense of um, peace. Because the crime that he committed was still out there, it was still open, and the fact that he wasn't being punished for it, it wasn't acknowledged that it was him, um, it was just gnawing at him from within, the, the actual guilt, the actual horror of, of what he had done was just airing at him from within. So it's only once you are confronted with sin and deal with it as it is that there is growth. And that's, that's the basic message of crime and punishment. Of course, there's many other themes. But... There. Um, and finally here, but love your neighbor as yourself, I am the Lord. So this is the famous statement that we have in the New Testament. And this is how Jesus Christ really sums up uh, the second table of the law. The second table of the law are commandments 4 through 10, and they're all directed to towards your neighbors in the world. Commandments 1 to 3 are directed primarily to God. Commandments 4 through 10, primarily to human beings. But of course, we're looking at human beings uh, through the lens of God. So we're looking at them as one who has been for, uh, as someone who is forgiven in Christ and we're going, well, how can I help my neighbor? How can I um, treat them as Christ in my life? How can I, how can I see them as somebody worthy of Christ's sacrifice? Uh, or uh, as, as uh, Christ loves enough to sacrifice himself for. That's probably a better way to phrase it. So if, God, if Christ has loved this person, uh, how, do you, how do you interact with them? Are you loving them as Christ loved them? Uh, and Christ went to the cross for their salvation. Uh, you are going to them to uh, help them live in the salvation of Christ. Okay, so... Um, this, this really comes up in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and all, all three of them have this, is um, Jesus is being confronted and, so, and, and he's being asked, well, what is the greatest commandment? So Jesus responds, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Now, now, that actually comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6. And that's one Jesus Christ points out. Uh, he's not picking exactly one of the Ten Commandments. Now, of course, uh, the commandment that Jesus just gives to love the Lord with everything you have is, is very much in line with the first commandment, you shall have no other gods, because what does it mean to have no other gods? It means that you are focusing on God as your God. You, you are living in him and him alone. So that's what it is to love the Lord, is to devote all yourself to him and not um, going any other which way into sin. So he, he is your God. You are living properly with him. But So that's what Jesus says is the, is the greatest commandment. And then he immediately gets into, well, and the second greatest. And nobody asks him for the second greatest. He just puts it in there. And the second greatest is love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus is directly quoting this verse in Leviticus chapter 19. Uh, so Leviticus 19, verse 18, part B, if you want to be very specific. And that seems to be kind of an odd one, because that also, well, the one in Deuteronomy 6 is actually a little bit more understandable, because that's kind of in the mindset of, of all the Jews, because they meditate on that chapter. They even pray the prayer that's in Deuteronomy chapter 6 uh, multiple times a day. That's one of the Jewish customs. Um, but, but with this one, this isn't something that, people are really looking at that much. They're, they're um, focusing more on the Ten Commandments or other areas of Scripture. They're not necessarily pointing to the middle of a chapter here in Leviticus and saying, this one. Um, but Jesus is, is, is pointing this one out. And really what he's doing is he's summarizing the second table of the law is, is love your neighbor as yourself. So that's what we were focusing here. So there's the fifth commandment, seventh and eighth that I was talking about, but I was also bringing up examples with the sixth commandment. And then we could just as easily do this with the ninth and tenth, the coveting commandments. And we could also think of the fourth commandment, and, uh, honoring your mother and your father. So 
uh, if you're if you're thinking about well, how do you properly live in society? How are you properly loving your neighbors? You'd be doing a lot of these things. Now, kind of beyond this, we have asked. Well, Jesus Jesus asked, well, who is my neighbor? And this this is this comes up in Luke. So people people ask Jesus, well, who is the neighbor that I'm supposed to be caring for? Uh, who who is the neighbor that I'm loving? And Jesus responds with the parable of the Good Samaritan. So basically, parable of the Good Samaritan, you have a, you have a Samaritan. Oh, sorry, uh, sorry, you have a Jew. <laughs> you have a Jew. So the Jew starts off. So the Jew, he's walking on, on the road. And this is the day where you still have lots of crime on the road. So he gets robbed. He's, he's beaten near to death. Everything he's taken. Everything he has is taken. So he's basically naked on the side of the road. Um, now you have a couple guys come by. One's a priest, one's a Levite. And uh, both of them need to be uh, living in accordance with cleanliness laws. And they can't be around any dead body. It, otherwise, well, how are, they, how are they going to go to the temple and engage in proper worship of God if, if they're unclean and they can't, they're, by God's law, can't get into the temple? So they go, well, I have my own well-being to, to think of because I need to go there in order to receive uh, the food that I need to eat and feed my family. So I'm going to pass by. So both of them pass by. Uh, the people who are considered the holiness, holiest in, in the society of the day. Then a Samaritan comes up. And a lot of people don't really understand the significance of a Samaritan coming in. Uh, I mean, like, uh, people, people in the here and now, because you hear the parable of the Good Samaritan all the time, so you're kind of uh, blind to the fact of how drastic Jesus was being here. So this, this would be like saying, um, so a Muslim came along, and he helped this guy out, when the two Christians, the pastor and, and the bishop, the pastor and the bishop, they walked by this guy, they didn't help this guy. But this Muslim, this heathen guy, he helped this guy out. He helped the, the, the victim out. So that's, that's kind of how drastic Jesus is being. Is, is a heretic is helping, is helping somebody out better than the people who are considered the most virtuous within the faithful community. Anyways, so um, uh, the Samaritan comes by, uh, helps this person, uh, get well, uh, sets him up in an inn, uh, goes away for a time, comes back, uh, completely pays for the entire time. And uh, Jesus then asks, well, who was a neighbor to this man? And the response is, of course, the one who showed him mercy, which is the Good Samaritan. So that the Samaritan was a neighbor to the man. Now, the issue uh, we quickly find is that Jesus isn't in asking... Um, or sorry, the response to what Jesus is asking isn't um, the neighbor is is the one who yeah the neighbor isn't exactly the one who we would expect. So it it we would expect the Jew to like the the victim to be the neighbor, and then you're you're responding like, hey, the neighbor was the Jew that you can show mercy to. That was his name. But no, um, Jesus is saying, well, who is a neighbor to this man? And the, and the guy, and the response is, well, the good Samaritan. Because Jesus isn't asking about, well, who was a neighbor to, or, or sorry, um, was the Jew a neighbor to the good Samaritan? Jesus is just saying, well, what's going on here? Uh, in terms of who was acting as a neighbor. And the, the response is, well, the one who showed mercy. So when we look at, um, well, who is our actual neighbor? So who are the ones we're supposed to love as ourselves? It is anyone to whom we can actually show mercy. So if we can think about, well, is there any person alive that we can show mercy to? No, we can actually show mercy to every single last person in the world. And the expectation is, according to the parable of the Good Samaritan and Jesus Christ's explanation of this command, love your neighbor as yourself, is like every single person is our neighbor and we should be actively loving them. We should actively be showing them mercy. So, um, and, and just to be clear, the, the verb love your neighbor as yourself, the love, the word for love is also the same for mercy. Uh, it, it gets translated um, both ways from time to time, that, that word. 
So uh, when Jesus asked, well, uh, who is neighbor, the man could, you could also translate what the man says as um, the one who showed love. So if there is anybody you can show love to, show mercy to in this world, well, then they automatically become your neighbor. So it's not about um, um, is this person being a neighbor to me, but are you being a neighbor to that person? Are you actually showing love to them? Because if you're denying your own status as a neighbor in loving another person, uh, then you're kind of removing yourself from the community of faith right here. Because the goal is to love your neighbor as yourself. Because if you're a neighbor, you're loving everybody else as a neighbor, as somebody to whom you can show mercy. If you don't do that, then you're not a neighbor. Then you're not somebody to whom God shows mercy. So if you are to somebody to whom God shows mercy, you're in the covenant of God, and then you're automatically helping somebody out. And we see this um, in the New Testament in a lot of different places where, um, where it comes up, where, like how, how are you to be saved, and the salvation is brought up, well, you're saved by grace through faith, but now do good works. So it's not as though you're being saved uh, by your works, or works are part of your salvation, but works are a necessary accompaniment to your salvation in the sense that they're out, outgrowths of the grace and love shown to you. So if God has loved you, then you love your neighbor. In fact, this is about half, maybe more than half, of the letter of First John, which is John saying, like, yeah, you, if you're in the faith, you're going to be loving your neighbor, you're going to be doing good works for them. But... Um, yeah, all of this stems from Jesus Christ himself because he is the greatest neighbor to all of us because he is the one who showed God's love to us on the cross and in him we see the true picture of a neighbor, somebody who has an infinite amount of love for every last person in this world. Do we show this? No, which is why we still need Christ to show to us mercy. We still need him to give us mercy, to forgive us our sins, and to encourage us to greater works of love and, and truth that we might take care of other people in this world. Amen. Okay. Uh, let us close in prayer, beginning with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord Jesus Christ, who came into this world to deliver us from sin, death, and the power of the devil, you were a neighbor to us. You were God's love upon the cross for us, and you showed to us the abundance of God's mercy in your forgiveness. We ask you, O Lord, to encourage us to good works and proper faith, uh, acting in faith towards our neighbors, that they may be blessed through us, uh, that, you, that you may bless them through us. We ask you, O Lord, to uplift us in, in the Spirit, to encourage us by your word, to chastise us according to your law, that we may do what is right from this world, and we may live abundantly in your grace. In your name, O Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.